I am delighted to announce that today's video is about turn construction. It's TCUs. Did, did you just interrupt me? TCUs. Seriously, just because today's video is about TCUs doesn't mean you can just interjacently overlap any old time you When we talk, recipients are expected to give a response, and they have to do it in an appropriate, precise time frame. But what is that time frame? How do we know that sometimes coming in too early results in an interruption? I want Did you. Stop. You? But sometimes coming in early is okay. We finish each other's sandwiches. How do we know when to talk? The answer is turn constructional units, and their sibling, turn relevance places. These are some of the most intimidating terms in the EMC lexicon. Eight ethnomethodologists ethnomethodologists affecting ephemeral ethnography, so let's unpack those a bit. A turn constructional unit is the term for the smallest possible unit that could constitute a whole turn at talk. After one of these TCUs, someone else is allowed to take a turn talking. So you can go back and forth doing TCUs and have a normal sounding conversation. Hello? Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine, how are you? Okay. Good. The end of a TCU is called a transition relevance place. Every time you have an end of a TCU, there's a possible moment where transition to the next speaker is relevant. It's their opportunity to talk. So these two items can be said to mutually constitute each other. Very little conversational material ever looks as straightforward as one TCU, then another, and so on, though. For instance, although talking over each other is supposed to be rude and interruptive, we do it all the time. And it isn't treated as rude. It matters precisely where in a TCU we talk over someone. Take collaborative completions. Collaborative completions are one possible way to talk over someone else, that is, to overlap their talk. Collaborative completions are when a recipient manages to complete a speaker's turn, sometimes alongside them with the same words, and sometimes providing words for them. Because that was the only time this summer that I really went up there is when she got sick. Really sick towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> they stuffed me because I looked at me and thought, oh, she's so thin. <laughs> to be able to do that, though, you have to be able to figure out the timing and content of the speaker's talk. And we can do this. Humans are fantastic at it, in fact. It's called projection. It's the ability to fairly reliably predict when a TCU is reaching a possible completion point. It allows you to start talking right when the prior TCU is ending, which avoids that meaningful dispreferred silence I've talked about in another video. But our ability to project on time is also necessary in order to speak on time after any TCU. We don't absolutely need a musical phrase to accomplish this either, as is done in. Sandwiches. Most evidence analyzed so far demonstrates that we anticipate the timing of TCUs and TRPs using features such as their prosody, their syntactic components, and their pragmatic action. Was that the last word? A license to kill. Okay, and then Living Daylights, when the hell? That was like a year or two before. Oh my god, I don't even remember that. In this call, the participants are talking about the most recent James Bond films. Adam asks about a possible recent Bond film, and Ben supplies the correct answer, that A License to Kill was the previously released film. Ben pragmatically fulfills the question without using a traditionally complete syntactic clause, and uses falling prosody. Furthermore, there's a silence after his talk. All of these would suggest that his turn is complete. He has done a possibly complete TCU, and we've gotten to a turn relevance place. Adam can take the next turn now. And we see that Adam orients to Ben's TCU as complete, because Adam starts his own turn. But, da da da, Ben adds an extra TCU. It could be that because the silence was so long, Ben became concerned that Adam did not understand the prior TCU. Ben's additional TCU, which we call an increment, since it incrementally adds to the prior, elaborates his first TCU. He makes it syntactically complete, filling in the rest of a traditionally complete syntactic clause for English. This not only clarifies that a license to kill was the last one, and thus that the question has been answered, but it also makes it extra clear that Ben's turn is complete, that the TCU has reached its completion point. By now, though, Adam has overlapped Ben's talk, starting his own turn, precisely because the TCU had already gotten to a possible completion point. We see a similar situation happening again in lines 6 to 9. Note that Ben's turn on line 5 is not a misprojection of the same kind, though. It's acceptable to overlap the projectable ends of TCUs, and Adam's question is clear as soon as he says both the next movie title and when. The possible ending is projectably coming up, such as was that or was it or was that one. No matter the ending, the question is likely the same, so Ben jumps in with an early response. Early onset and overlapped TCUs are quite common, especially during storytelling. 
We can, for example, slot in responses to a long turn without taking over and taking a long turn at talk ourselves. For instance, we can react to someone's story with an assessment, even while the first speaker continues their turn. Oh, he's still a baby. Oh, she's not God. dating yet. No, God not. <laughs> you know, smoking cigarettes in the no, bushes God, and the no, things no, the kids please. do. No, no, no. There's a limit to how far ahead we can project. And in fact, breaching this limit can also come off as annoying because you end up speaking for someone else. I'm Captain, Captain Picard, right? EMCA therefore distinguishes between overlap, which is accepted and normal, and even desirable at times, and interjacent overlap. Interjacent overlap is one that occurs in the middle of a TCU, at a point when it was projectable that the person was not yet close to finishing. Interjacent overlap tends to be the one that people treat as interruptive. They'll restart their talk to ensure it was attended to in the clear of someone else's talk, and they may even explicitly sanction the recipient for that interruption. This is all the more obvious in formal settings like interviews and political debates or courtrooms where we make the rules of no interjacent overlap really explicit and enforce them in a really strong way. But that is why at the outset, this particular clip looked so surprising and got so much attention. Let me just say that the Department of Treasury has cooperated extensively with the Senate Intel Committee with the House reclaiming Intel my time, Committee, reclaiming with the Senate time, Judiciary reclaiming Committee. Reclaiming my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter of my fact, time. Mr. Secretary, the, time. the time belongs to the gentlelady from California. But if the interjacent overlap in reclaiming my time is so marked, especially for a formal pre-allocated turn-taking context, why is this one acceptable? Go on holiday elsewhere in the European Union and you find yourself on the wrong side of the law, you'll get help with interpretation, you'll get legal help, you'll get assistance. Right. <laughs> Guess what UKIP did? They voted against all of those measures. Another example of the European Union yeah. keeping us yeah. safe and protecting our rights. And if you get arrested Nigel, in Spain, Nigel Farage, if you, if you get arrested in Spain, Nick. There is no sanction here against Farage for treating his opponent's talk as literally laughable and indeed talking over him. This lets Farage put his counterposition on the table way earlier and avoid wasting his rebuttal time later making his own opinion known. Furthermore, in order to prevent Farage's behavior at the moment it occurs, the mediator would have to actually use interjacent overlap themselves to interrupt the current valid speaker. This strategy hijacks an interactional norm. Certain utterances or actions are allowable in overlap, namely continuers and laughter as well as body motions that support the ongoing TCU, like nodding or passing over an item. Goodwin examined a subset of these utterances that are acceptable in overlap and called them continuers, things like mm-hmm and yeah. They occur in overlap with TRPs to show that you're passing up the opportunity to take a turn of your own. Right. Yeah, I have a really cool telephone that's coming out now. It's got a little LCD screen on it, mm -hmm. and you can, you're, you can do it. It's already out. You know, they have it, people have it in the office. Mm -hmm. as an LCD screen. This is just the absolute basics of TCUs. There is so much more to examine with respect to how the body is involved in TCU management, how grammar and prosody are part of projecting TRPs, how to combine TCUs in longer turns, how increments work, how gaze is coordinated with TCUs, how overlaps develop. I mean, this is one of the most central concepts in our discipline and one where we have decades of work in multiple languages and definite evidence that this may be a real, proper language universal. This was the first thing that made me truly grasp how systematic spontaneous speech actually was. <clears throat> so turn constructional units are the primary building block for our everyday speech. They are the central hinge on which we project when to talk, how to maintain turn taking, and how to collaborate together in interaction. Collaboratively complete it with me. Turn constructional units, TCUs. Eight eth methodologists as ethically affect eight eth methodologists ethically affecting ephemeral ethnographies. Eight eth methodologists ethically affecting ephemeral ethnographies. <sighs> that was cut one. Okay. <laughs>